No friends, there always will be sinful, selfish reasons not to give to God's work. So let's start now. Let's start now wherever we are. Very good evening to you as we stand. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come to think about our use of money this evening, still our thoughts on our minds to help us listen to you. Amen. I read a real life story a while ago of parents who returned from a holiday to Stuttgart airport and managed to leave their five-year-old son behind in the airport as they both drove off home in their separate cars. Bit of a real life home alone story. And you think to yourself, as tempting as it must be at times perhaps, how on earth did you both manage to drive home and leave your five-year-old son behind in an airport? Did one of you not check that he was with you? We've got a question, don't we? What were their priorities? What are our priorities? What are our priorities? That's the big question God asks us in Haggai chapter 1. Haggai had a message for God's people after they had returned from exile. The exile was God's judgment on his people where he allowed them to be defeated and thousands of them were carted off by the Babylonians, their conquerors. The capital city Jerusalem was ransacked and the temple was burnt to the ground and was a pile of rubble. The temple had been the the dwelling place of God. So it, it signified his presence with his people. And it was where the people went to make sacrifices for their sins, so provided access to God. And so its destruction was an incredible spiritual disaster. And so rebuilding it, getting it going again now that the people had returned, that must have been a priority, right? Well, the book of Ezra tells us that things started well. They got going. But soon there was stiff opposition from the surrounding nations. God's people gave up, and the work stopped. In fact, it stopped for 18 years, which is an awful lot longer than the average builder's tea break. And that's where the fiery prophet Haggai comes in. And here's the first thing that he says to us. Look at your priorities. Look at your priorities. There's an outline of where we're going on the back of a service sheet if you'd like to follow along. And here we go. Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. That's on page 791. Page 791. Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Now, it's not that the people didn't want to rebuild the temple. It's just that other things just kept on seeming more important to them. But the problem is that that's basically them saying, it doesn't matter whether you're fully present with us, Lord. We have enough of your presence at the minute. And rebuilding this temple, that's going to be such hard work. And it's going to cost so much money. Eventually, Lord, when things look a bit better for us, then we'll get going. Then we'll get started rebuilding this temple. The New Testament equivalent of a temple is God's people in local churches. That's how he dwells in us as we signify his presence to the world. And the equivalent for us of what Haggai was saying to the people then is to work at building up the church by using our time and our gifts and our money. But since it's a giving review uh, this evening, we're gonna focus and apply this especially to money. Here's a question for us. Do we treat our giving financially to church like a household chore that we put off, meaning that we never even get started? 
how, how might it go? Well, maybe oh, I'll give to church when, when I'm graduated, but, but not yet. Oh, no, you see, I, I'll give when I've got myself established in this job. Oh, well, at the minute, I'm, I'm trying to save every penny that I can for this house deposit. When I've got that sorted, then I'll give, but not yet. I need to do some redecorating, then I'll give. Oh, but, but now, now I need to, to save for the future. There's, there's so many needs in the future. I've got to save up for my retirement, for my children. I'll get going in this soon, but not yet. Oh, friends, there always will be sinful, selfish reasons not to give to God's work. So let's start now. Let's start now wherever we are, even if, for example, the students here among us this evening, even if we've no income and precious little money. One good way of committing to give and keep giving is to give even a little regularly, say each month, to a ministry here at JPC and to other Christian work that we want to support. Commit to doing that and stick to that. Because God's message in Haggai inexcusably pulls us away from saying, one day I'll get going and giving, but not yet. To asking ourselves, how can I keep saying not yet to God and his work? How can I keep saying not yet to God and his work? So on to verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. It is, is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses while this house lies in ruins? There's a disagreement over how rich or poor God's people were at this time when, when Haggai was with them as a prophet when the book was written. But panelled houses in verse 4 makes me think that their houses were both comfortable and for the age contemporary. And I guess that's a lot of us. And to be honest, that's a trajectory most of us are on. For example, the house we recently bought came with phone-controlled central heating. So I can turn it on just in time to be nice and cosy for me coming home. And then with a little tap, it's off again. Healy knows absolutely nothing about it. Um, obviously, I'd never actually do that, uh, of, of course, obviously. Um, but God asks a question of his people, doesn't he? He says, look at your priorities. Is it right that your house has all the mod cons, and yet my house is a pile of rubble? And he asks that question of us too. Is it right that we live in supreme comfort while neglecting God's work? Answer, no. It's not right. But friends, as Ramsey said, last year, among, along with those at St. Joseph, Joseph's <clears throat> and Benwell, we gave £1,006,000 pounds to God's work here among us, including gift aid. Praise God. Praise God, because ministry-wise, God has been good to us. And it's safe to say that we're not sitting on a pile of rubble physically or spiritually. And yet when we look at the world around us, when we look at our ongoing need to be built up in the gospel, we know that there's so much work still to do. And we need to press on with that. What an exciting opportunity we have. And so for all of us, Haggai presents a challenge to look afresh at our priorities. Maybe one way of doing that would be to would be to make a list of everything that you spend your money on. Some things are going to be necessities. Food, clothing, the bills. Some things will be necessities. But some things will be non-necessities. And some things, frankly, luxuries. Could be anything, couldn't it? Maybe regular meals out, a new latest phone, a new car. Could be anything. And then we need to look at the money that we give to God and his work. And we need to ask ourselves, how do those two figures compare? And what does that say about what's important to me? So let's start 
by looking at our priorities. But looking isn't enough, says Haggai. No, we need to consider our priorities by looking closely at the things we think are important and asking ourselves, do they really pay off? Verses 5 to 6. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Oh, the people were just not satisfied with what they have. After all, they had seized seeds to sow. They had food to eat. They had clothes to wear. But these things didn't satisfy them. And perhaps in an inflated economy, their money just didn't go the distance. Their selfishly used resources just seemed to, seemed to slip through their fingers. A student here a while back was desperate to get a first so that they could begin their career right at the very top. And they spent all their time chasing, chasing, chasing after it. They did get their first in the end. But then when they got their results, they felt strangely empty. Another Christian I know strive for promotion at every available opportunity, but are just never satisfied. We can chase after material comfort, feathering our nest, extending our homes, going on elaborate holiday after elaborate holiday after elaborate holiday. And these aren't wrong things, but they can too easily, can't they, take too high a priority in our lives. And they cannot, says Haggai chapter 1, provide ultimate satisfaction. And over-prioritizing them doesn't please God. Verse 9. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills and the grain, the new wine, the oil, and what the ground brings forth on man and beast and on all their labors. God just isn't prepared to be second best. So he sends a drought, a pretty extensive drought, and he, give, he gives Haggai's message to wake the people up. The people had worked hard. They'd worked so hard, but they couldn't. They literally couldn't make the crops grow. They couldn't make the dew appear. Only God could do that. And God was able to take that away with as little effort as it takes us to blow out a candle. Now, the danger of these verses is thinking, if I don't give, God's going to punish me. But this chapter is talking about God's discipline when his people disobey him, which was designed, if you like, to, to grab them and pull them back to him. And applying that to us as believers, we need not fear punishment from God. Jesus dealt with the punishment that our sins deserve on the cross. He dealt with them once and for all. But God does still discipline us. He disciplines us by letting us feel when he's displeased with us and letting us feel the dissatisfaction that disobedience and half-heartedness brings. And the truth remains, God will be displeased with us if we do not give sacrificially to his work. Because the priority for God's people then is the priority for us today. Verses 7 to 8. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it, that I may be glorified, says the Lord. For us living the other side of Jesus' work on the cross, we glorify God by sharing the gospel and building up the church. And that has to be the number one priority in all of our lives. And that involves a considerable amount of time as we serve one another, as we go out of our way to tell others about Jesus. 
and our money as we give to make the range of ministries that we have here at this church happen, which are aimed at all of us, zero to 100, of which we only ever experience a small amount of. So as one Christian said to me recently, the more I earn, the more I'll be able to give to God's work. That's a good reason. That's a really good reason to succeed in my career. And there's an example of someone who was considering their priorities. Thirdly, lastly, we need to live out God's priorities. Reading from verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of, their Lord, their God, of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. And people finally saw that future good intentions were not enough. They needed to make God their priority now. So they came to God's word and they made a new commitment to obey it. They feared God, verse 12. They gave him the honor that he deserved. They started to put him first. God? Well, God stirred them up to action and very quickly they began to work on the temple again, pouring their time and their money into that. We too need to put a a line for our to-do list. We need to put God at the top of that. And everything that we do in life needs to pass through that filter of him. Which means that one thing we'll do is, one thing we'll need to do is live out giving financially to God's work here among us. In our giving literature, we recommend that each of us conducts uh, an individual review uh, of our finances, working out as best we can what our income will be for the next year. And once we've done that, we can decide how much we should give to God's work here in a way that says, Lord, you are my priority. We suggest 5% to our gospel work, world mission partners around uh, the world, and 5% to the work here among us in JPC. But that's just a starting point. Because some of us may be able to give much less, but some of us much more than 10%. Some of us are Christians who have been here for years, but we need to consider our ways. Maybe we're able, maybe it's time to give more. Some of us are Christians who have not yet got going with giving, and we need to, so we can honor God in this area and not just leave it to our brothers and sisters to support what we are benefiting from. The main thing is that we prayerfully consider what to give and respond to the church office with as much detail as soon as we can, and that really helps our leaders plan responsibly. As I've studied this passage over the past week, to be honest, it's, it's hit me hard, as I've often and regularly thought how I feel to prioritize God and say not yet to thinking about how I could use my time and my energy and my money better for him. And I'm sure I'm not the only person here this evening who knows who knows in their heart that they said not yet to God far too many times. And friends, that's why it's so reassuring that we're reminded in Haggai that God is committed to us even when we so often feel to be wholeheartedly committed to him. The ending of this chapter shows us that we can give sacrificially of our money and our time knowing that God, the Lord of hosts, in other words, an all-powerful God who says to us, I am with you 
to provide for you and to bless you. He is the God who is with us. And so whatever challenges we face individually, together, whatever challenges we face as a church, financial or otherwise, we know that God is with us if we remain faithful to him. And friends, that, that is great news for this giving of you. Let's pray. Lord, we're sorry that so often we can push you to the corners of our lives when you deserve to be at the center. You deserve to be our priority. We're sorry for the times we prioritize ourselves over you and our use of money. Please forgive us and help us, we pray, to trust that you will be with us when we faithfully give to your work. Thank you that you have provided so abundantly for us in this church over so many years. And we pray this giving review that you provide all that we need to do your work and to do more of it. Knowing that you are the God who is able to do more than we ask or think according to the work, according to the power at work among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. sing our final hymn together, Church of God.